the great hill stations of Asia. That, that must have been, was that a labor of love? Yes, it was, actually, it was. <laughs> yeah. You yeah. spent a lot of time in Asia. I you? spent a lot of time in Asia, yeah, off and on over a long period. Yeah. So. Oh, get ready. Welcome, welcome very much to Conversations, where it's a pleasure to welcome to the program Rob Barbara Crosset, who is currently the uh, United Nations Bureau Chief for, um, for the New York Times and has had a long and illustrious career with the Times, if I may say so. And it's a pleasure to welcome you, Barbara, very, very much to Conversations. Thank you. Thank you. Manhattan Network. Thank you. Uh, we were just chatting about you have this new book out that we want to let people know about, certainly. But I wonder, uh, the, the, hill, the Great Hill Stations of Asia that's just currently in the bookstore, but I wonder, maybe you could share, if you would, your own background, perhaps, you know, where you hail from, your education, that sort of thing. Sure. And then we could talk about some of the major challenges that are confronting, uh, let's say, the human condition as we, as we begin to look ahead, because you do write on a very large tableau. But right. Could you share your own background for us, sure. please? Sure. Uh, I have a very non-establishment background. I was, born in a, I was born in Philadelphia, but grew up in a small town in Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. um, my father was a Mennonite, uh, one of the early settlers of... Pennsylvania. My mother was a European immigrant after the First World War, so um, I, I developed an interest in, in things foreign quite early on because my father had a rather large worldview. In the Second World War, uh, he got involved with uh, the Mennonite Relief Committee, mm -hmm. Mennonite Central Committee that worked in a bit. And my mother, of course, had all her family there, and so from a very young age, I remember packing boxes and sending them to Europe, so I, I had a sort of outside. But I didn't have uh, the opportunities to travel very much uh, when I was very young, apart mm. from the usual trips. Kids get taken to Canada and so on. Yes. But uh, I, do, I just developed a, a, a great interest in, in foreign things, foreign, somewhere along the line, and kind of have been following that ever since. I've yeah. spent a lot of my adult life abroad. Once I, once I got to graduate school level, I was, um, I was able to go to Europe, and uh, I had traveled a bit and lived in um, the Pacific, the Western Pacific, mm -hmm. before that, and I've sort of never looked back. So, oh, you know, whereas a lot of people in my profession come into sort of foreign affairs writing uh, f through uh, distinguished Ivy League educations and so on, I went to a small Lutheran college in Pennsylvania uh, and uh, basically have been a journalist all my working life. I've yeah. never not worked. All right, very <laughs> good. And, but, but you were talking about these things around the family table and so forth, and the family background was one that encouraged you to think in terms of a, a kind of a large uh, yeah, you know, planetary did. view. Mm -hmm. and we did. My father had been a teacher uh, briefly uh, after he left school uh, during the Depression, and, uh, and so he, he tended to make us at the dinner table to keep, there were three of us, my sister mm -hmm. and brother and I, to keep us sort of under control, I guess. We, mm -hmm. we got asked questions, you know, like, what's the capital of Russia? Yes. And, <laughs> and then when we traveled around the country, we did have relatives here and there. We, mm -hmm. we, we you know, we did the things kids do. We yeah. got license plates, and we looked for, for differences, and we learned state flowers and things. So the maps were always in our house. Geography yeah. was always in our house, and right. he loved to give us ge geography quizzes. This was great fun. You know? Well, geography is what I did my work That's in. Right. I loved it because <laughs> you can be interested in anything and get away with it yeah. in a certain sense with, yeah. with geography. And you say went to Lutheran College. Well, uh, did Muhlenberg you College. It's mm -hmm. a, a good little college in yeah. Allentown, Pennsylvania. And you could see that you were very zero. It was it a liberal arts with a social science and uh, foreign yeah, affairs actually, background right from the get-go? I mean, you didn't go mm -hmm. off. No, I start. No, I didn't. Yeah, and okay. uh, although there were lots of things that tempted me, yeah. uh, science did for a while. Uh, biological sciences, yeah. not uh, not uh, physics or anything like that. Mm -hmm. But uh, I had also had a shortwave radio when I was in high school, and um, and so I I kind of listened to odd places and sent away postcards saying, "Did you hear from us?" I was just telling someone I think I must have an FBI file mm -hmm. somewhere because during the Cold War I was getting postcards from Bulgaria and places like that because mm -hmm. I was simply responding to their shortwave radio. Yeah. Um, I listened to things like Hawaii Calls, that old program. I, I just had an utter fascination. I don't know why, yeah. uh, except that, as I said, there was always a sense of an outside world around us. Right. Um, but in college I started out actually studying, I was going to major in languages. Right. I, I already spoke Spanish. I had a three or four years of Spanish in high school, which is unusual for a rural high school. Yeah. And, and you were uh, able to pick up Spanish <laughs> where you could actually use it from the high school? Well, you know, training. my father's Mennonite church. Some people have church. a facility for it, you know. Well, um, I don't know. They, the, yeah. the, some of the local churches began to, to do help s projects to help migrant workers. Yes. And even in Pennsylvania Dutch country, which was a pretty closed society, they mm. were bringing in, in, in particular, there were some Latin American workers who had come in, 
and were a bit at, at sea. They had no sort of social milieu. And mm -hmm. so some of the local Mennonite churches began to establish Spanish-speaking Sunday schools or yeah. social groups and so on. Mm -hmm. So I got to practice Spanish there mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. a little bit. And so I, I became very interested. But anyway, once I got in college, I think we, you know, you talk about geography yeah. encompassing everything. Yeah. I thought languages might, but then I, I realized that that really wasn't enough, so I, I moved to, to history, uh, European yeah. history. Well, history and geography. Between those two, right. you've got almost everything right. except cosmology, perhaps, yes. or something. Yeah, but you had a comprehensive, large-scale view of things that you sort of had intrinsic to you, and, and, and a wide-ranging intellectual curiosity, I well, guess, I, maybe that's from puffing, the get-go. That's pretty, pretty right. much puffing it up. Yeah, but, you know, well, I did, but, yeah. I did have a lot of interest, and yeah. it was... Um, I, you know, I did other things, too. I played hockey. I chased boys. I mean, I did all the things that you kids did. do. You played hockey, know. ice hockey, or field oh, no, hockey? Oh, field hockey. And field tennis. Hockey. And tennis. You're right. So you had an athletic thing and that sort of thing. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, that's, that's good. You had that up front. And then did you, did you go on? Did you, did you think, could you see from your, let's say, early college days or something, that you'd be heading for journalism? And did you have, uh, or did you sense that you had a facility for writing? Uh, from early on, mm, yeah, I could. I, I always, uh, I always did well in the kind of courses, social sciences and things, where where we wrote uh, term papers yeah. or reports. So now that my parents always said was because I read a whole lot, right? All the time, I read a lot, and I read books beyond my age level, books that I had to, you know, get signed out specially in the library. Um, so, huh. so I, I was a tremendous reader, and I, I really, I often tell people that I think that writing, I'm not sure that being able to write is necessarily something that you're born with. I think that being being very familiar with language and good writing mm. h helps a lot to, yeah. to sort of, in the same way, I suppose, in working in languages, you, you develop a, a fluency that's more than just being able to speak in the same way you develop a writing fluency mm -hmm. just from practice, which is reading a lot of good writing. And yeah. so I, I think, I think that, that had um, a lot to do with it. But when I went to college at Muhlenberg, mm. we had a good student newspaper, which was very active. And I learned a lot there. I learned um, that also the mechanics of a newspaper. So you got involved with that student newspaper. In the student newspaper. Yeah. And I've often told people afterwards, I never studied journalism formally. But right. because Allentown, Pennsylvania was a small town, we had a small job printer who did the paper. It was a weekly paper. Yeah. I was allowed to go and wander around the press room and places like that where, where uh, union rules obviously would not have allowed me to in a, in a major city or anything. Yeah. So I, and they were they were wonderful people who taught me a lot about the the technique and the art of printing. Mm -hmm. In fact, I also learned a lot about newspaper design, and uh, and that really carried me through. It was enough to build on, oddly enough. I think American student journalism is is really very important. I don't know any place in the world that has journalism quite like this at the college level, so that you can learn an awful lot about about uh, how a paper works. Yeah, in terms of the layout and these kind of things, apart from just the writing of an article that will go into right. it, having mm -hmm. an overall sense, right. of having sense, of, yeah. sense of what the paper is about. That's right, having a sense of it's about how to design it, how to make things fit, how yeah. to choose articles, what kind of headlines to write. And I imagine that my, my counterparts who were in college radio and later on, I suppose, television in the larger universities learn the same way. Different thing, journalism. Your journalism, obviously, you have concerns of the journalistic. Is it a different thing to be a print? oriented journalistic person than to be one who's electronic oriented? Is there, is there a big chasm or a big difference there? I think the chasm... Or what do you see? Yeah. Now I think the chasm yeah. is much larger. Uh -huh. I think... Uh, I, I've been at the New York Times now 25 years. Yes, congratulations. Well, That's a thank milestone. You. I don't, yeah. Well, I, yeah, you know, I sort of feel, is, is that something you kind of... I've been in one place too long. <laughs> but um, anyway, I, I yeah. think when, when I began, yeah. uh, or, or perhaps even earlier, uh, television news was more serious. Uh, there were certainly more programs that were, um, well, for example, I remember uh, theater, theater craft playhouse and yes, things like that when yes, I was a yeah. child. So, so there were, there was, there were, the, there was a lot of, there was a lot more, I guess, verbosity. It would be called now on, yes. on television, yeah. but of the right kind. Yeah. And and now I think the gap is much, much wider. And I think that's w why we see a lot of self-examination in the media right now. Tremendous amount, and there's yeah. probably going to be more. I expect you know because television has become entertainment, and yeah. uh, and uh, the fear is that a lot of print people will follow in some way in order to be competitive. Yeah, we did have Ed Murrow and the Harvest of Shame and some of those right. real documentaries right. and right. white papers, CBS white papers. Yes. And they seem to have gone by the way. You don't see that that you don't see that um, that tabloidization, if that's the right term for it, creeping into the print media or not? Uh, um, is it I part of is it a broad cultural thing, I guess is what I'm saying. Or I, I think in this country everyone thought the newspapers would be changed by television. And and I think we had to adapt to that to some. I've been an editor and a writer at the Times, and I've seen changes too, obviously mm -hmm. big ones in 25 years. Yes. But um, I, I think in many ways 
a greater influence on us was magazines, uh, yeah. in the sense that fe or feature feature writing became more um, important. It was also a difference in attitude toward how news stories should be handled, that there should be more leeway to, to be descriptive, to be not opinionated, which is still uh, considered outside the limits of news, although in other publications it isn't. All right. uh, yeah, that's important. Be, right. see, there has to be a room for opinion and, 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 and commentary and that right. sort of thing within the general journalistic uh, charge, sure. but there is also the idea of some objective port reporting of That's right. who, what, when, right. and Right. And in many ways, in, in, the, in the expanding the sections at the New York Times and so on, it, it also replied to magazines that, that were, uh, so many magazines are being uh, created to ap appeal to so many different tastes and interests. Right. Yeah. We now have very successful sections in the Times that appeal to ev everyone with uh, so many different interests on food, on home design, and a lot of people were very much against this because they felt it was diluting the kind of purity of the news newspaper. But we've all changed, and it's, it's worked out fine. Mm -hmm. But I, I think that the chasm between us and television, which was always there, is probably even much greater now. I think very few people, um, certainly of my colleagues in the press, would rely on, on television news. Uh, we, we read wire services. We, I watch some, some news programs from Europe. Yeah. But it but it ha but it has a tremendous influence on the mass consciousness. I mean, the television. So many people get yeah. their 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 ideas of the world, as it were, in a certain sense, from that. Up till now, but you know, I think what's happening now is the internet. Yes, is, it's amazing. It's kicking amazing in. Amazing phenomenon. It's amazing, and you know, it's kicking in. And and, and uh, someone has just done a very interesting opinion survey yeah. on young people and news, and found out that young people will say, "We don't watch news." But then you say, well, what do you do? Well, we get a lot of information from the Internet, uh -huh. and I use the phrase information. But in, yeah. a, in a way, these things are news. Yeah. And, and I find that because I have sort of bizarre little interests in certain Asian countries and things that, that don't get generally covered, yeah. the, little, the little sort of gang of people in this country who care about what goes on daily in Bangladesh or some other place, and I'm sure there are equivalents in, in certain African countries or Latin American countries that aren't covered uh, regularly, mm -hmm. go into the Internet. They have... Of files. I get, for example, India file. I can also now read local newspapers from a number of countries through the internet. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's, it's, it it's is changed, a miracle, isn't mm -hmm. it? It's I changed mean, a lot about how people follow international news, yeah. certainly. Yeah. And, and, and it seems to be growing at such an almost, uh, you know, it, 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 it couldn't have been predicted 20 years ago such oh, things happened. I think happened. even less. S less synergistic things mm -hmm. happened uh, that uh, wouldn't have uh, dreamed that this sort of thing could be possible, World Wide Web and so forth. Right. It's an amazing thing. Yeah. I wonder back to your thing. You picked up early on uh, from college days and so forth on, on foreign affairs, international affairs and so forth. Yes, you this yes. Uh -huh. broad thing. Were you, were you right from the time, maybe you could share a little bit, 25 years, that's a milestone. When you came, how you came to be associated with New York Times, what were you doing then? And were your, was your eye upon international affairs at that time? Were you doing some other things? Or no, it was. I had, uh, I had gone to, to London uh, as a graduate student, I wanted to be a graduate student. I really wanted to go to the University of London, and I, at that time, you, one could sort of audit the courses yeah. or sit in on certain seminars. There were certain professors who, who allowed this, and I got a fellowship. I, um, my, my former husband and I were in Colorado. He mm -hmm. was in naval intelligence, and mm -hmm. what he was doing in Colorado was always a standing joke, you know, like mm -hmm. where's your where's your battleship? Yes, out in the plains. But so I went to the University of Colorado and got a master's degree in history. It gave me something to do, and there they gave me a fellowship to go to Europe. They took me to Europe. Did you do world history or did you intellectual no, history? No, by that time I had kind? focused. By that time I was doing, because I because I could do um, uh, sp Spanish, and yeah. uh, I became interested in the 17th century in England, uh, which where where there were of course uh, ties to the Spanish um, and Portuguese. Crowns and also sure. the history of the two countries collided, mm -hmm. but also I was interested in, in, in some of the British settlement of of, in, of North America. Uh, I had uh, often on uh, I never joined the Quakers, but because I grew up in a family that had two two very distinct religions, I sort of wandered into the center and I found the Quakers very intellectually acceptable when I felt that I wasn't a religious person. Mm -hmm. And so, but the Quakers who had of course settled Philadelphia where I was born. Mm -hmm. Uh, I began to learn were very different from some of the Quakers who'd stayed on in England, and I was interested in that. And then I was interested in how these, these Brit British people who came, and others, my father's family, Mennonites from, from uh, Germany and yeah. Switzerland, mm -hmm. uh, and collided with Hispanic cultures in this country. Uh, so I was playing around with doing something on that early period, when, uh, and possibly doing a PhD. When I found in England, um, I really needed to get a job, and it, it was easier to do. And I was able to get a job in a w newspaper published by the National Union of Teachers and um, 
in England. Uh huh. Uh huh. And so that gave me credentials in Britain as a journalist. That was a full journalistic job. Or yes, you, it was you were writing. It was full time. Written, yeah. And I at that time. So much of my life, I think, is just sheer luck. At that time, yes. Britain was going into comprehensive education, which mm -hmm. is something like our high school. So they had yeah. had very rigid uh, school separation at the age of 11 into children who went into academic training yes. and those who were just pu pushed to one side and did vocational. Right. They then began to try to be more like our high schools, which included everyone. I had taught, by the way, for a couple of years in a British grammar school. I taught history in England, but I thought that took uh, you know a bit of gall. But <laughs> English history, English yes, history. Right. Yeah. Um, and made wonderful friends among yeah. the teachers, and include a lot of my colleagues were wonderfully educated. Uh, the woman I worked with, who was head of the history department, was an Oxford graduate. She took me there. I she introduced me to a lot of the libraries and so on. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, so this education paper, uh, I just applied carelessly, seeing a uh, an ad, mm -hmm. and they took me on because they figured I was an American and must know what comprehensive schools were. Yeah, and that was the beginning. And once I began to get. Uh, qualified as a journalist in Britain and, and basically did a certain number of courses in newspaper design, which the British are very, very good at. Okay. I was adding up sort of things. I came back, uh, I got divorced, I came back in um, with my young son, who was very small, for a year, uh, not less than a year, and I went to work for the Philadelphia Bulletin, which now no longer exists, because mm -hmm. I could stay with my parents while I reorganized myself. Yes. But then I went back to England, and I really felt more at home there, and that and so altogether, I spent eight years in England. But the last three were at the Birmingham Post, which is a good newspaper in the Midlands. Mm -hmm. Easy place for me to live with a small child. Yeah. Um, we you just really got had French a considerable time in England. That's yeah, a eight, long years. Yeah, eight years. Yeah, that's a lot. Yeah. And during that time, I traveled a lot to the Middle East, all yeah. over Europe. Uh, and of course, I began to also get contact with my mother's family, which I yeah. hadn't had, uh -huh. which was terrific because now we've we've kept in touch through the generations, and we've even visited one another to keep our younger generations, my sons and and his cousins. Uh, in touch with the European branch because it's so easy when you settle here to sort of forget yes. the family where you came yeah, from, yeah, or at yeah. least to have them drift apart. And when you were doing that with the Birmingham, were you were you beginning to pick up on the international affairs beat? Yes, and that because sort of thing? Uh, yeah, because they they gave me things to write. As I said, they sent me to the Middle East for a while. I actually did Paris fashion shows. You know, I I had resisted doing any sort of women's news, and in mm. Britain they 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 didn't really force women in the, in the way that I thought was happening still in this country. There mm. were still women's pages, much more so here. Mm. Uh, and less so in Britain. Britain was going through, had the swinging 60s and all that stuff that happened there. It was a very fashion conscious, style conscious, kind of finally the Second World War period of, uh, of sort of, it was, it, was a, it was a grim period. It took a, Britain a long time, longer to recover from the war than most people thought. And then suddenly they burst out with lots of energy and creativity. And it was a terrific period to be there. Mm -hmm. So I was there altogether eight years. And then um, in 73, I, I really sort of gave myself a leave of absence. I was then the features editor. And I did sort of the opinion page and op-ed page of the Birmingham Post. I decided to give myself time off and come back. I felt I'd been away from the America too long, and my parents were older, and my son was growing up British. Right. Okay. So I came back, and I, you know, as I said, the story of Luck. this lucky break. Yes. I walked into a period when I had, by that time, established a lot of experience uh -huh. and had good clips. Mm -hmm. And also, um, the American media were beginning to feel the class pressure of class action mm -hmm. from women and other groups. That there weren't the, the newsrooms were too much white male. That's right. That's right. It was yeah. There was so some, the women's movement was just coming into flowering. That's that right. Time, and there yeah. and the Times already had a, a group of women had brought an action. Anyway, I came in in '73 and I tr I tried really tried out as I was hired as a copy editor. But mm -hmm. I was astounded that a lot of major news organizations uh, asked to, for me to come for interviews, which mm -hmm. was surprising to me. Uh, and when I started to put it all together, but anyway, I got a job at the Times as a co first as a copy editor, and um, and have been there sort of ever since, doing a whole lot of things. Now, why would you have been surprised that they were asking you to come, to 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 take on? Well, I had account? no. I, I mean, you, I had no American do. journalistic I training see, in the right, sense right, I, I didn't. Right. I didn't. Uh, these big organizations, I figured I would have to work myself up sort of from the farm school. Right. Yeah, I see. Uh, and uh, and it. And it was amazing to me. Uh, I, later, it was because by this time I'd established a, a, a large knowledge of a lot of things. I mean, Europe and some, as I said, Middle Eastern. So I could I could handle foreign copy, and I I never wanted to work anywhere but on the foreign desk. Mm -hmm. I wanted to. I really would have liked to have gone back to Europe. I thought at that point uh, to to report. Uh, later, I changed my plan because also while I was living in England, um, especially in the Midlands in England, I became. 
quite friendly with a number of people from Pakistan and India who had settled in England, and that was an area completely outside my ken, and certainly yeah. most Americans, because we had no colonial experience in That's South correct. Asia. Yeah, we should keep that in mind, yeah. Right, yeah. so when, uh, so in 1980, when um, I, I got a Fulbright Fellowship uh, teaching, teaching pr visiting professorship, uh, and sort of talked the times into allowing me six months off, I wasn't allowed to go for a year, um, I chose to go to India. And um, I taught there at a university for a while. So, and then that laid the groundwork for my going back as a correspondent later because I, I knew something about the country. Yeah, 1960s. There was a lot. There were a great number of things going on. We were, you know, there was all of the activity of the 60s, and then coming into the 70s, the Watergate and all this sort of thing. Were you picking up? Maybe it's worth touching upon. Um, let's see, you're a journalist, so we're going to report the news. Boom, you mm -hmm. know, very objectively and so forth. Were you, uh, uh, did you have political leanings at all in terms of the way you see things, or do you see yourself as an objective reporter, or did you have inclinations beyond perhaps, uh, or generally the, I'm not sure who it was who said that the press should, uh, should uh, um, uh, afflict the, what is the term, the, uh, they should uh, give, uh, what is that term, I'm sorry, I missed it now, but they should, uh, uh, they should report. Oh, I, I forgot the expression. I don't know if it uh -huh. was Mencken, but it was something to the effect of afflict uh, mm -hmm. the comfortable oh, and comf give comfort oh, to I the afflicted. Yeah. That sort right. of thing. Did right. you have a Did you have a sort of buy or did you have a certain kind of social sense of things and so forth? No, that and you know you did, or were you just strictly as a reporter, or how I, did you, how did you see yourself developing in terms of your own consciousness, in terms of understanding the human condition and advocacy journalism? Maybe it's not fair to ask. No, it's no, it's, it's a good question because. If I learned something in Britain, I learned that um, that there's huge sensitivity. There was huge sensitivity about discussing politics. It's, mm -hmm. It was it wasn't the same as here, mm -hmm. and I learned this really the hard way once. I, when I was a, an editor in a, in a position high enough at the Birmingham Post, we were interviewing somebody for a job mm -hmm. with I, the editor and I, and and I said to him, "Well, how would you describe yourself politically?" And the others in the room all froze. Yeah. And I, it was an American. I mean, I was trying to make conversation because the, the interview was sort of slowed down, and he didn't seem to know what to say. Yeah. And I didn't mean that he had to declare his political leaning, but that 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 was a very sensitive subject, like the British say, not talking about what you earn or things like that. You didn't you didn't do that, and it was a lesson I I really it, I it, I really learned. It struck struck home because I knew I could have in that case done damage. He could have said, you know, somebody there asked me about my politics. Right. And the Birmingham Post was a sort of conservative, in the British sense, newspaper. But I think there I learned. In many ways, it's almost a cynical press corps. It's almost an a a whatever. Uh, that's not really advocacy. It's kind of it's kind of stand back and take the Mickey out of everybody yeah. kind of attitude. Okay. Yeah. And I think that that served me well. At times, also is and always was extremely conscious of trying to keep advocacy out of it. In fact, uh, one of the great times reporters, Johnny Apple, and yes. you know, he uh, yeah. he once uh, argued with me that I should register to vote as an independent. When I had come back from Europe, I, I obviously had to re-register here and when I, in, in New York, and, it was, and I thought it was, a good, it was a good thing, and for many years I did that. Register as an as independent. As an independent, uh, because I thought, no, that's a good rule for journalists to, to, to do. I mean, just so that you, you really, even down to, to, to how you're registered to vote, you try to maintain the sense of balance. Now, I never had now, to he, report... Excuse me if I may. He adv advised you to register as, as an independent. independent. Had you registered as something else prior to that? I, when I was overseas, I, when I was voting uh, uh, in absentee ballots um, from Pennsylvania, I guess I was registered as a Democrat because it was very difficult to yeah. vote overseas. Right. My father was a Republican. My parents always voted Republican. Yeah. But, you know, I, I came into college, you know, it's the 60s. Yeah, that's attitude. what I was so, saying. It was a real time I mean, I wore an armband, you know, yeah. 26 Julio yeah. for Fidel, and I yeah. did all those things. And, yeah, of course, right. because I had studied Spanish, I right. was very interested in right, right. Cuba. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, like a lot of people, I kind of bought a into a, a sort of a lot of the general ideas of the time. Yeah. I think, you know, people yeah. ask me why journalists are often leaving aside political labels, mm -hmm. why journalists are often um, unshockable or too willing to accept uh, radical new ideas, or perhaps, as some people in this country would say, too left-wing, whatever that means. Mm -hmm. I often think it's, it's, it's because our job is seeing everything new all the time. You, yeah. you, you, you get a higher and higher level of being shocked or surprised. I was ex describing to someone who was interviewing me once about having seen people scalped in India. Now, I mean, you know, you read about scalping yeah. in the wars of the West or whatever, but I actually saw it happen to Sikhs during a time when they were being butchered in the streets of so Delhi. Right before your very eyes. No, I saw the oh. scalp. I mean, I saw the, the Sikhs 
because they have long hair. And yeah, beard. right, of course. And so yeah. the symbol, the symbolism of taking their hair off, yeah. they had taken off their scalp, yeah. and, and several of them, they were on a train that yeah. had arrived at Delhi Station. Right. But I mean, I, I or, use that only or, to explain that you know yeah. you, you have to you can't do the job if you can't look at that as a journalist or as I suppose a surgeon or something would yes. look, would look at it. You can't sort of get too involved. Yeah, Marshall McLuhan used to talk about that when he said that you can't become too involved if, if a surgeon is. They won't allow. I think a, I'm not sure. Yeah. They won't allow a surgeon to operate on his child that's because right. he's going to be too yeah. involved. Right. You have to be cool or detached uh -huh. in a certain kind of way, and that's a metaphor perhaps yeah. that uh, applies well to journalism and, a and also sense. So not to get too carried away, but these things do come in just in terms of one's view of the world and a, uh -huh. a, and a sense of, uh, you know, justice and these kind yeah. of things are part of a person's personality and their way of seeing the world. And, yeah. it, you know, it has a particular, it has a particularly important kind of relevance in terms of journalism, which is reporting objectively. Right. Supposedly. But one does always, you're looking for news and news yeah. is new. Right. So, right. so naturally you're following new, new ideas, new right. ideas, whether it's I, I think you know journalists, are, and we have to be inquisitive and curious. Yes, we can't yes. we can't sort of uh, prima facie say I don't want to cover that or right. I won't do this because right. I don't believe in that. Right, right, uh, right. So so you you have to suspend uh, many of, yeah, and yeah. Many, and many suspend many sort of instincts towards something. I mean, right. I think in the end we all and journalists wrestle with this always. We all have our own backgrounds, our own ways of thinking. Some of us have religion. Some of us have. So, and naturally, these things are part of your of your thinking. Oh. I, in in the case of growing up American, you have certain concepts of civil order or human rights or things that that are just something you grow up with in society. So you know, when we're accused often of, of judging, for example, developing nations too harshly, yeah. some some of it is this, but but also not all of it. I mean, sometimes you know there are genuine problems, and that's just an excuse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But these are all these are all the world view that one has and so forth. Uh, you were you've covered the international uh, you know beat as it were. Now you're the UN, perfect. Yeah, it's perfect. It's fine must be a, for me. Must yeah. be a fascinating place to be and so forth. But uh, did you did you have uh, did you have a sense of uh, you know, uh, some sort of a grounding in uh, a geopolitical understanding and so forth. Uh, George Kennan, these kind of things. I see you at the Council yeah. of Foreign Relations. Do you keep a real, uh, an interest in that? And do you have a do you have a sense of uh, of the uh, strategic thinking or the geostrategic or geopolitical thinking? And uh, we live in a post-containment world. Soviet Union's imploded. Mm -hmm. This sort of thing. Do you have a do you have a do you have a sense of uh, an overall vision of the operation of this interrelated spaceship Earth that gives a sense, or do you think we do, let's say, the world and the mm -hmm. world leadership in the uh, in the wake of the implosion of the Soviet yeah. Union? So, do you think that's still shaking out, or do you it's think it's still coming around? Out. And what are some of the major problem areas, and what might be some of the glimmerings of what be might begin to emerge on a large scale in terms of how we're going to? See things geostrategically. I think it's. An, think? I, I, I think there are no answers to all those questions yeah. because they're good questions and they're timely. Because I think, and the UN is a good place to look at this yeah. because after the because th so many things come together. Yeah, there. absolutely. And, and, and every every issue drifts through. At absolutely, some point. Yeah. And, and intellectuals that come through there are amazing. Really. Oh, the, and, and it's the, the underreported. Diplom the diplomats. Yeah. I've worked in Washington twice as a diplomatic reporter, yeah. and and the, the diplomats assigned to the UN missions are really the best that their nations have in many cases, which is I'm going to come back to in a minute because we have a problem with multilateralism, that big word. Yeah. Um, I think the feeling was that after 1991, anything was possible. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's why we got the Gulf War Coalition together, really, in many ways. It was a new world. Mm -hmm. And at the UN also, um, the feeling was that anything, big peacekeeping operations were, were ordered. Uh, lots, there was lots of uh, sudden enthusiasm for a lot of international projects. And then things kind of drifted off and, and kind of uh, fractured a little bit. And I think now there, there's, some, there's some, a little bit of apathy among many of the bigger nations. There have been setbacks. There have been this long series of gruesome ethnic wars yeah, and a awful. lot of internecine fighting that mm -hmm. no one could have predicted. We now have had this shock of India and Pakistan joining uh, nuclear weapons. Yeah, we'll definitely uh, want to talk about that with so, you. Yeah, so, you know, these things, yeah. these things have meant that all the great hopes of 91 were really hopes at the time that were really not fulfilled. Mm -hmm. Now, as the world moves into this very messy period, there are many nations who believe that it has to become increasingly integrated in, in its geopolitical decisions and so on. Yeah. And this is where the United States stands so much apart. One of the things that's happened is that while other nations often felt they took greater advantage of the collapse of the Soviet system and the bipolar world, yeah. the United States and many Americans seem to have um, 
in, and in, certainly in Congress, maybe not the American public, which is another story. They, polls often show they're much more interested in the world than people think they are. Really? Well, that's yeah. encouraging. Yeah. Because, yeah, okay. Yeah, for, for, for interesting reasons. Okay. But anyway, but Americans drifted into isolationism. I think it's provincialism. I don't think yeah. it's isolation. I think it's, I think it's a lack of knowledge here about an awful lot of things in the world. And just this week, I read, for example, that the Austrian foreign ministry has prepared a little booklet for children on foreign policy. What is foreign policy, which they use in schools? Mm -hmm. I, I, I think we have to go far and wide in this country to find something similar. Yeah. Uh, the reason being that Europe now is, is pulling together, and the Europeans, some of the Europeans, the British ambassador just told me, they're streaming their, dip, their highest expectation type diplomats, the best and brightest, are being streamed into into these careers in organizations like the United Nations and NATO and the European Union. Mm -hmm. These are now considered the prime jobs. The, in the old days, the prime jobs would be an Arabist or a Sinologist mm -hmm. or a, a Russophile, mm -hmm. that you would, be, you would be going to some country or region. Now the aim is to, to look at the multilateral organizations, the, the organizations particularly the UN, yeah. at a time when the United States, we're, we're within months of losing our vote in the General Assembly, yeah, and is drifting away from the United Nations yeah. at a time when this may be the only way yeah. or the only forum in which to hold a lot of these fragmented problems, uh, sort of contain them, a yeah. different kind of containment. Yeah. So it's a, and, and who knows in the next century uh, where this is going to go because it's, um, we're, we're going into a few years here where the United States has become the obstacle to international progress. Yeah, yeah. What is the source? Is the Congress? Remember? I mean, what is the source of that attitude that is so negative towards the United Nations, do you think? You're there. You're looking at it. Is it does it reflect? I heard you say that the, the, uh, the, the citizens are more interested in these things than uh, some people mm -hmm. cynically tend mm -hmm. to believe and so forth. Yeah. But what is it that is behind this? Um, some people see David Corton has written a book on, mm -hmm. you know, when corporations right. rule the world, and in a certain sense that there are forces that are going to undercut and turn the, the, the UN right. into a think tank that right. would be impotent and that sort of thing. Yeah. Where are those forces coming from, and what, are there some things? Tim Worth now is coming over. Mr. Right. Turner's committed just, to that yes, and so uh -huh. forth. That might be helpful. But maybe you could address that. What does that come, where does that come from politically in the United States? Well, and what is its future? Um, I don't. I, where where some of the undercutting is coming from? I mean, the globalization of the economy is yes. one is really a separate thing. In many ways, there are people who argue that that international business is now the most uh, the most cosmopolitan and internationally cosmic, minded. Yeah. Uh, yeah. A writer, Robert Kaplan, who's written a ter terrifically sort of scary book called, you know, The, the Ends of the Earth, where you yeah. sort of how, how the, the, pl the center, I mean, the place is falling apart, the world is, and these problems will come to us, yeah. you know, basically, mm -hmm. uh, Africa, a Asia, and so on. Yeah. He says that if you want really good, um, sophisticated writing now on, um, on, the w on world affairs, read uh, the, read the uh, big American um, magazines like Fortune and, and so on, because... You, you can see the business community, yeah. uh, the, the money magazines and so on. The business community has, has by its nature now, developed a much more global uh, view and therefore a global yeah. interest. And because they want to be well informed, there's yeah. a lot more activity. Um, you know, you, you re read a lot more than you do in the sort of mainstream media. Yeah, it's, right. It's, a, th right. it's okay. a theory of his. Yeah, well, it's um, an idea. Yeah, it's an idea. And they certainly are. We are globalizing, and, yeah. the, and, the, and the, the, they're, they're coming into more. Some people feel uh, there have been people throughout the history of thinking of these things that nationalism itself, which has been the major place in which sovereignty has resided, mm -hmm. that we ought to, in a certain sense, be able at some point to begin to get past the you know, the, the, the commitment to nationalism, we should get a globalization, a synergistic whole, mm -hmm. whole uh, pattern of understanding, and probably there's something to be said for that. The United Nations is an institution that allowed for that, but sovereignty still is at the nation state level. And um, Absolutely, and the United Nations is no more than the sum of its parts. Okay. And so if the United Nations it is It is not weak, more. There's not no. a synergy there? No, there's not, something more? not really. No, it, okay. It, it has only the power to do things or not do things that the governments allow, and, in oh. this, and the United States is still the most powerful government there. No, right. The Security Council has the most power of uh, of any any part of it. Although the General Assembly can vote whatever it wants, it yeah. doesn't have any enforcement power. Right. But I mean, the United Nations can be woven into this, and I think uh, recent Secretary Generals have seen this uh, into the global eco economic system. You could even use the global economic system. For example, a small tax on arms sales would pay for peacekeeping. A small tax yeah. on, let's say, air travel might pay for 
something that has to do with you know keeping uh, air safety standards or perhaps uh, uh, you know helping the United Nations pay for other projects or whatever. So, yeah, but then what is there going to be? There, is there going to be an agency for enforcing the tax? Uh, you know, well, this what is, is the agency there is, or, or a Tobin no. tax, you know, well, on, on, tax, on circulation yeah. of, uh, you know, right. of, of money, yeah. uh, currency, uh, currency transactions, right. and so forth. But who's going to be the, the well, entity that's going to do it? Where is the federalist is the, this, paper or the confederalization the of the world that, uh, yeah. you know, is called for, or is it? No, know? and no, and I or, think I think that what's happened in Congress is they've gone off the deep end. Tobin was, in fact, the cause of this problem. Really? The Tobin <laughs> tax is basically what people are talking about, yeah. and, and or variations of it. Uh -huh. But... No one has ever suggested the United States is going to be taxed by the United Nations. No one. Now, <laughs> in, on the Hill, yeah. they will say that this is Boutros Ghali's idea, that mm. the, they're going to levy, levy taxes. They're, they still have this in legislation. Yeah. It's, it's never been an issue. Right. It's just not there. Uh -huh. it's, a, it's a completely phony sort of red herring yeah. uh, toward, uh, for people who don't like the United Nations. Mm. Um, people have suggested, for example, if a Tobin tax, it'll never happen, but mm. if it had. Um, uh, say, let the IMF or the World Bank yeah. or create some international organization. You know, there are people who feel that there has got to be eventually some kind of regulatory mechanism for currency trading because uh -huh. when the dust settles on what happened in East Asia... Yeah, that is, yeah, that is frightening. You know, and it's still going yeah. on. The Thai, yeah. the Thai was just telling me... Yeah. He said, can't you, do, can't you do something about the mutual funds? You know, they, they're only half informed, so they see trouble in Indonesia, and Thailand takes a kick. Now, yeah. Thailand has done a lot of things right. And some of those fellows walk right. with awful big league boots yeah, when they go into right. those countries. I and mean, they, they move don't money. Hong Kong, any, yeah. any, anything. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, no. I'm yeah. saying it's a... But they're getting pretty up. Right. And, uh, that's right. the wrong word, but they're getting pretty... Yeah. And they're working in a, in a field almost where there's no... Uh, I mean, it's like they're loose in a candy store. That's right. There's no yeah. regulation. And whether or not out of this... I mean, there have been, you know, sort of occasional hints that in this currency crisis, particularly if it affects us, you wait and see. There will be people who are saying, we've got to make sure that we don't let just money, these, these people who are moving money around like this, without regard to, to consequences. Yeah. Uh, is there some way we can do something about this? This yeah. is going to be one of the big, I think, one of the big problems of the coming century. Now, I'm not saying the UN has a role, but, but that the ideas that are floating around out there are all floating around because there is a sense of a problem. Yeah. But no taxation in the United States, never, that's never, and, and I don't think federalism, I, I don't think it'll ever get off the ground, and I don't think mm -hmm. it should. I think a lot okay. of countries really do feel, although you, one might argue with breaking down immigration walls right. and so on, yeah. the, the world will become more the same, mm -hmm. but countries, as long as they are political entities that are working, you know, do have sovereign rights. I don't think any country would disagree with that, mm -hmm. and I don't think anyone in the United Nations sees any reason why not to have sovereign rights. Uh -huh. The UN is just a group of international civil servants uh -huh. who follow the orders of the member nations. Yeah, right. And, uh, and usually it's uh, under Security Council orders uh, in one way or another or General Assembly. Yeah. And it's not, in, it's not going to interfere. It's there as a kind of vessel or a forum in which to hold these problems and let people come and work them out. Well, that's something. Yeah, or all, the nations, of the world, yeah, all yeah. the nations of the world right. are represented in New York. As yeah. I said, they have very good um, diplomatic uh, so, uh, co the diplomatic corps is very good. Yeah. Individual missions are very good, yeah. and it's a perfect, a perfect place. Now, when I said Americans are Americans know this uh, at the grassroots level, there are a lot of Americans involved in United Nations activities because they 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 take their single issue interests in politics mm -hmm. and they bring them to the world stage. Uh, these conferences the United Nations has, which have which have been so badly bl blasted by Congress and others, yeah. have brought hundreds of thousands of Americans, to Cairo yeah. to talk about population, sure, Beijing. to Beijing to yeah. talk about Istanbul. women, yeah. um, the, you know, the, and, and, and it, environment, yeah. in right. the environment, and, and, and in every, almost every area, human rights, Americans are very involved in the United Nations mm -hmm. as, as mm -hmm. what we call NGOs, non-government organizations. Yes, right, right, right. And they understand the danger of epidemic disease. They understand the dangers that come with, uh, a, you know, greater international travel and right. globalized economies and yeah. things. And they're working very hard within the system. Um, their views are not reflected in Congress, which seems to believe that Americans are just not interested in, in foreign affairs. Yeah, I mean, we need a more interested Congress or something like that. But I mean, you have you have that you have that uh, the uh, we we have maybe we could just talk. We, we have the Bretton Woods things. We, you know, we have the International Monetary Fund, World Bank. We have these institutions. We also have something coming out of the UN, which is called the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, right. 50th anniversary now. This Eleanor year, yeah. got that. Laura Roosevelt got that done largely, mm -hmm. and so we bridged a lot of differences in getting that right. statement together. Uh, that's a universalist kind of mm -hmm. statement. 
Is it appropriate for us, do you think, the human species, let's say, as we come to this time, for us to be trying to reach for overarching universalist principles that we can all, in a certain sense, sign on to or agree to? Or is that, is that, is that, moving, toward a, is that moving toward a thing that's going to breach uh, or is going to abridge uh, sovereignty or, or individuality of the various peoples of the world and homogenize mm -hmm. them into something uh, that is not uh, appropriate? Well, I, don't, I think if you ask the nations of the world, you might get one answer. If you ask the people of the world, you might get a different answer. Okay. And in case, of, in case of human rights, yeah. are human rights universal? Um, I think eloquent arguments for a certain universality are made by Asians, by Africans, by others. I, I mean, when you come to basic things, torture, you know, the right to, to individual liberty, the right to travel, the right, the right to own property, whatever, right. I, I think you'd have to go far and wide in the world to find ordinary human beings at the grassroots who don't want these things. Everybody wants these things. Yeah, and if you won't got through to the consciousness of the Kalahari Bushmen, you'd probably find a similar, you'd find it resonant or, well Or perhaps that. some other. Yeah. Uh, Islamic women. They're yeah. One of the most exciting things happening in the world now is the way Islamic women are coming together from many different countries okay. to try to look at their fundamental problems that they're having with All Islamic right. militancy. Right, okay. And, and you'll find that while they're, they may not agree on a lot of things, should you wear a headscarf, should you not wear a headscarf, yeah. I mean, they're basic things. They want the right to inherit property. They yeah. want the right to own property. They want right. the right to have uh, custody of their children, mm -hmm. and so on. So, so these things are, are universal, and I, I think that many nations uh, argue against un this universal concept because, because in a way, they see it as uh, as undermining not national their, sovereignty but their authoritarian. Oh, 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 no, no. Okay, I'm sorry. You know, authoritarian co governments can say, well, as Lee Kuan Yew in Singapore says, yes, Asian right. values. Yes, right, right. And right. yet, I've heard Buddhists from Japan or elsewhere very eloquently talk about Asian values. Asian hmm. values are, this, are are at root ethically the same. I mean, Confucianism. You can find very great values that, yeah. uh, that influence civil society and so on. These things are not... Maybe we have been using language yeah. that sounds foreign and, and, and therefore... And maybe there are concepts. I lived in Asia a long time, yes, and I know, I know that there is a consent... The idea of consensus is real, mm -hmm. that Asians shrink, many of them, not South, not Indians or Pakistanis, but many Asians shrink from confrontation. It's just not right. It's not done. It doesn't feel comfortable. Yes. Whereas we are... In you know, we love things like... Uh, fights over politics and things, and even more so this some... fellow on television is the most popular one, where they scream and yell yeah, and Yeah, exactly. Like crazy, now, that would, be, know, but, that would yeah. make a lot of Asians extremely uncomfortable. Well, it makes me uncomfortable. But so, no, I see. So yeah. I think there are some cultural yeah. patterns yeah. Where, where, where consensus, where perhaps uh, the idea of sort of battling it out is not, is not sort of natural for whatever philosophical or other reasons. But mm. that's one thing. That's different from, from people suppressing a population and saying they're doing it on behalf the of their culture. In the name of some cultural yeah, value. Exactly. Yeah, exactly right. And then it, but it comes around also to this idea of, you know, in the, in, we mentioned Bretton Woods and the International Monetary Fund. We're talking, people will be talking about, in that realm, international politics or economics and that sort of thing, um, the right of those who are, let's say, in a certain sense, in a catbird seed kind of position to say, we want to make sure that there isn't crony capitalism, mm -hmm. that it's not mm -hmm. being done this way, mm -hmm. and to establish those principles, and then those are objected to in the economic realm. You think that's, uh, that's an appropriate kind of, uh, that's something that's well to be addressed? And can there be universalist principles of, you know, that contract holds, yeah. this thing holds, right. that kind of thing, and that they're universalist and that they would ultimately, just as in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the Universal Declaration of Business Practice or something of that sort, is an appropriate thing for, uh, let's say, the West, if that's the right term, or the powers that be, uh, to be trying to establish in terms of having this, uh, the commerce of this world work in a, in a long-term interest of uh, efficiency and uh, the betterment of the human condition? Well, I don't think... If you understand what I'm yes, saying. Yes, I know exactly yeah. what you're saying. And I don't, I don't think it has to be seen as something that's inflicted on them. Okay. Or something that's created here and, 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 uh, and everyone has to fit the mold. Yeah. I think that you, one can make an argument for some of these things mm -hmm. the, uh, on surely pragmatic Grounds. Well, I, I mean, partly was trying to do that. I was because wondering if there crony was a, capitalism yeah. is it drains the lifeblood of countries, yeah. and 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 also doesn't help the people in those societies. Exactly. They, exactly. They're right. being uh, they're being denied uh, a lot of the economic pie because right. because the money is going from friend to friend and bank to project and right. so on and you know inflated property markets and that. I, so I don't. I think that um, I, I think that there, in Asia there have been some who've said you're, you're forcing some of these. Uh, don't you don't set conditions for us. Conditionality has become a great cry, yeah. war cry. Right. We don't want conditionality. But conditionality in the IMF, I I think is is born of experience. Uh -huh. It simply says. I remember being in Indonesia years ago when I was a reporter there, 
and, and people talking about the corruption in Indonesia yeah. and also the Suharto family's control. Yeah. Right. And e people would sometimes say, well, corruption is an Asian thing. We, that's yeah, another, that's another debate. Yeah. But, but, yeah. But, I, but others would say, no, wait a minute. Well, we used to say slavery is a thing. Or well, something, sure. You know, yeah, but There's yeah. a point in which corruption begins to sap national development. Right. And at that point, somebody has got to blow a whistle. And yeah. this is what was happening in yeah. Indonesia, yeah. where everyone was taking a percentage, the, the, the sort of Suharto family taking a percentage of right. every piece of big action, yeah. and, you know, where, 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 where corruption goes all the way down. You know, they, they size you up when you apply for a driver's license right. to see how much they should charge you. I mean, where there are no set fees. One of the big, pheno one of the interesting phenomena of this last 10 years has been the growth of an organization called Transparency International. I don't know. It's yeah, based in Berlin. Yeah. Two ex-World Bank people right. uh, founded this to, to begin to start a citizens' movement for anti-corruption around the world. Good. And it's taken off. And Good. a lot of countries in Africa, in Asia, here, elsewhere, have chapters. And their idea is for, for, for local people, grassroots people, to begin to... In, in the same way that a human rights group would look at prison conditions well, so, yeah. or whatever. Mm -hmm. and, and also to make it unacceptable. They've pushed in Europe, you know, where, where the OECD has finally yeah. begun to act against the, you know, European businesses could simply uh, take tax deductions for commissions, bribes paid yeah. in other countries. Yeah. Yeah. This, so, so, so the idea is that we're not, we're not saying our system is, is perfect. We're saying that, look around, our system has worked and it's, Singapore, it's worked. No corruption in Singapore. Singapore has taken the least hit uh, in this. They have a they have a, a, a very clean economic system. They may have problems poli po with politics. Yes. Uh, well, that's something that wants to be traded. That's one thing that wants to be understood. The trade off with politics and the authoritarianism they did there. and so they forth did there, yeah. is something that wants to be guarded against. That brings yeah, it in. Right. I guess what we're trying to get at is whether or not there's certain kind of universalist values that we can begin to get to that help us all work together in a, in a maximal way rather than having, uh, having things clouded over. If you have that transparency thing, there will be some people who will say then you could bring that home to the United States. You could bring that home to the mm -hmm. whole world and apply that sure. to the whole world. And I guess in a certain sense, we have a system we, we, that we have that we operate in terms of now economic thinking. Uh, we have the uh, geostrategic thinking from a historical pattern. We have the UN with these institutions in place and so forth. What is your sense? Do you think that we have in the world an order that if it's just in a certain sense fine-tuned, as the Keynesians used to say or something, the system that exists as it is now could be changed without, in, uh, without you know, just fine-tuning it? Or do you think that there's in the situation with globalization and particularly, we haven't talked much about, potentially technological displacement of labor in the, econo in the economic process and so forth, do you think that there's some largely seen new system of understanding that might emerge upon the scene that uh, is not discussed every day in the, you know, in, 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 the, in, the, in, the, in the in the analysis of the of the institutions that are are operating and trying to advance the human prospect. It's do you not think there's discussed here. Big changes coming. Do you do you sense that there's some big changes that might not be seen in the in the everyday reporting that is called for, or do you think that we can just sort of muddle through as the British said? And uh, we'll do some of that, and perhaps it might be better served by just muddling through rather than trying to look for some large paradigm shift or something. I, I think it's not discussed here so much. I think you've, it's discussed much more in Europe because they've had to reach down to their philosophical roots, really, for European Union. I mean, mm -hmm. we know how Europeans right. have, have killed one another over mm. the centuries and Absolutely. how fractious Europeans have been. Yeah. And, and Europe has been. And so they have, they have thought this out a lot, and they've begun to see the strength in working together trying as much as they can to save what they can. Obviously, their cultures and languages are important to them, too. Mm. Uh, this is why I think they're, they're becoming a more powerful force at the UN, and they're much more effective than the Americans who, who aren't thinking this way. NAFTA is not the EU, and so there's no way you can... It's not really the same group of equals that you have right, to deal with. Right, right. You don't have any euro. Of, yeah. so, so you talk about the system. Now, I, I think... I was thinking of it in a planetary sense. Well, I I don't, yeah, maybe know, that's... A, large systems thinking kind of thing, you know. It's, I, I, th I think the lar large system will only work if the large countries want a, a system of some kind. Mm -hmm. I, I, again, I, 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 yes. I would stop short just pragmatically of any, yeah. kind, of, any kind of federalist system. I think it's, it's, it's certainly not, not in, in the near, not, maybe not even in the next century. But, 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 for example, at the United Nations, there is a system there that could function. Yeah. There are things that could have been avoided. We all know about Bosnia and some other places. Mm -hmm. Um, the, 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 the UN took a lot of flack for that, but the truth is that the major nations, usually the United States, held back 
Now, if the, in Rwanda, the genocide in Rwanda in 94, for, for months, Absolutely five horrible. months, the United yeah. States did not allow yeah. the United Nations to take yeah. the action that the yeah. Secretary General had recommended uh -huh. and send a credible force. Mm -hmm. um, there, are, there are places all over the world where, where the United States waits until it's too late to give the go-ahead. Mm -hmm. Often the French or the British will take the lead. The French, particularly, because they, they're, they're not afraid of projecting their military might, and British to some degree, too, here and there. When it comes to sort of getting somebody in between two groups of people who are determined to destroy each other, mm -hmm. at, even in a small mm -hmm. place on a small scale. Mm -hmm. So the system is there, but the system will only work if the big nations, and right now it's the United States of America. Well, let so I guess work. maybe in a certain sense what I was saying is, you know, Mr. Bush used to deride the vision thing, when mm -hmm. he would say the vision thing. Do you, do you, and, and we're, do, you, do, you, do you think there is called for, or do you see emerging perhaps politically out of this nation as it relates to the world? Um, um, a, 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 a vision that's alternative to the one that is the commonly accepted wisdom of the way things are organized. Do, do you see a change uh, or, or, or not? Or do you sense that there are many people who will say that, uh, you know, stock market's going gangbusters, everything, people are well, and, you know, this sort of thing, all these things. But there's a great deal at a, sub at a, low, a level of angst. Mm -hmm. uh, this technological, un this technological mm -hmm. displacement thing I don't think has begun to be addressed myself. Mm -hmm. but, but there's a great deal of anxiety, some people will say, and that this is likely to come out like an punctuated equilibrium in mm -hmm. uh, evolution, that there was likely to be some sort of a, of, a, of a major transformation. I don't know whether you sense that or that there are major problems in terms of the, the way we're operating this country and then this country in terms of being the one major superpower in the world. Well, I think Large there are real humans. problems. I don't think we have a foreign policy that's coherent. I don't. Think that's what it, we don't. We don't, and yeah. I don't. And I don't think that at, at the UN, the United States, the United States uh, position at the UN has shrunk for lots of reasons. One of which, because we don't pay our bills, and that's why yeah. we're going to lose our vote uh, at, in, in the uh, General Assembly. Um, I think the United States. I have not reported on the United States uh, in my journalistic career, sadly, mm. but um, I think the United States, from what I've seen, looking at it often from abroad has a great capacity for healing and, and for creativity and yes. for solutions. Yeah. And I think sometimes we take a long time, we go through a lot of trouble, but, and there's a lot of angst and hate and other things. But I think in the end, we, we, for some, maybe we're lucky as a nation, yeah. kind of come out close to right. And um, I think this has happened here with, uh, you know, downsizing was a horrible thing for many people. But in many ways, now people say it was the right thing to have done. I'm not going to make judgments on economy, but I think within ourselves we, we seem to we, we seem to face up to things that I've lived in countries that they're never going to face up to: racial problems, uh, discrimination, um, corruption, all these things. I mean, we have corruption too, but largely people get caught and go to jail, or most of them do. A lot of them do. Well, yeah, in most countries, most of them reform. don't. Yeah. Kind of campaign finance reform and the way the campaigning is done. Well, and so forth. there are major problems. Well, this is are, a this is a this is, a a, this is very bad. I think the Congress now, and the national government now, I, I think there there are real problems both in Congress and yeah. in the executive on 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 the front of campaign finance. Yeah. But also, well, also partly this goes back to our original discussion about the media, what the media has done to campaigns. But that's another yeah. whole story. Yeah. But I think our problems are not so easily s within the world. The United States is not does not project itself as a as a problem solver. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, and uh, you know the thing. So you ask a question. It's a, a question you can always ask. So here we are. We're coming up. Uh, Two hundred thousand years ago, we first appeared. We're all mitochondrially DNA linked into a common ancestor. Come out of Africa. Two hundred thousand years ago, we have an incredible Promethean capability. This technology has given us. We have these awful disquieting things about the growth of AIDS in Africa. Mm -hmm. Twenty-five percent of the population. Mm -hmm. or we have these challenges that are there. We have a tremendous capability, technologically augmented, to bring life support and understanding, and we understand things much more than we did just just even within our lifetime. It's mm -hmm. been exponential. The the line that's going like this was not even hyperbolic. It's almost L-shaped in terms of our technological capability. Given all of that. Are you generally, uh, to ask an old question, are you generally optimistic, optimistic or pessimistic, no, or how do, you, how do you feel about the human prospect? Uh, well, I think the technological capability has, in fact, widened the disparities among humans. Um, mm -hmm. And as, as you can see, uh, even within this country, if you talk about who's on the Internet and who's not, but I mean, yeah. look at the world there. This has the the information revolution. Not just that; it's not the gimmicks or the or the or the toys. Mm -hmm. It's the knowledge. It's the expansion of the mind. It's the things that people can plug into in this country, yeah. that that people in Burma or whatever could only 
not mm -hmm. even dream of because yeah. they wouldn't even imagine in many places and yeah. or a very small elite in a country like that yeah. would would have it and it's this expansion this this ability to go for example into you know whether you want to grow tiger lilies and you want to get into a, a page on lilies yeah. or whether you want to examine uh, some some new forms of cancer treatment yeah. because someone in your family or you perhaps are ill i mean the things that americans can do now and and, and others europeans and so on but i mean this i think the technology is there but but it has separated us so if we're, if if it's going to help bring us together, there's going to first have to be this awful gap of technological gap overcome before we can before its effects will be felt anywhere but you know among the most well-off people in is, the world. Is the gap going to is there the potentiality for that gap growing to such a portion where it would result in some sort of an implosion over all of the system and that uh, the the inequities that might em emerge and so forth would become such that the, the system itself might just um, implode? Well, one thinks, you know, the he human life has come so far. <laughs> it's not going 200,000 years. Yeah, yeah. It's, not yeah. Going to, it's not going to implode. So but, but, but we may be in, you know, as you see, for a round of... It's not just AIDS, although that's horrific because there's it no is. cure. Yeah. But it's other diseases coming back in, right. in large numbers uh, abroad, uh, tuberculosis and uh, even polio in some places. Uh, you know, the sort of small percentage of countries that where the vaccination hasn't reached 100% yeah. just allows that door to open. Right. New kinds of malaria. Malaria is a big killer everywhere yeah. in the developing world. Yeah, we have so we, have, we a, have a lot to do. It's a challenging time, yeah. to put it mildly, and so forth. But I mean, it's one. But it's also one of uh, a qualitative change. Mr. McLuhan used to say the action is at the interface between the systems, and we may be at a time of uh, incredibly, you know, of a, of a of a of a of an opening upon some possibilities that just simply haven't been there historically, and surprises come there. But if there's going to be somebody who's going to be reporting on it, reporting on it very well as we move into this new millennium, it's yourself, and I want to thank, <laughs> thank you, you very much. We've run, <laughs> run out of time for this. Thanks and let me inviting. make sure that, let no, my pleasure. Let me, let's make sure, let's let the people know. She's got this really very, very interesting and, and uh, delightful read. It's a new book that she, she's just got out. It's in the, book sales, in the booksellers now. And it's called, again, it's called The Great... Hill Stations of uh, Asia by Barbara Crosette. Mm, very light. None of these heavy. None of not low. No, it's things. great <laughs> writing. You know, it's really great. I've had a chance to look at it. And it's a pleasure to have been able to welcome, uh, to have, to share her perceptions with you. We on Conversations invite you to tune in. We'll be coming back again next week. That's it for this particular program. Once again, Barbara Crosette, thank you very much for coming into the thank studio. You. And if I may, for all of your work over the history of the New York Times, it's been uh, very enlightening for a great number of us who follow your work thank with you. great interest. Uh, until next time, then. Thank you. Uh, Wide-ranging tableau. I have a sense, I don't know, I get this sense that there's going to be some changes that some sort of a large-scale thing, I don't know, maybe, you know, that uh, things are building up to a point where um, almost like a liberation or something, you mm -hmm. know. But I am optimistic. But there's a lot of challenge out mm -hmm. there. And, um, but I think uh, in economics, and, and it's a, uh, you, you, do you see yourself being at the UN for a good while now? Or I, no, usually. I mean, I've, been, I've all been there four years, and I, I, I don't know what their plans are, but usually they don't like to have people stay too long in one yeah, place. So right. it's been interesting for me because I've been able to reconnect to a lot of American thinking and writing on foreign affairs, yeah. which you don't always have time. And also because I meet so many people. And all Did, the we, should have gotten a we should have gotten a chance to talk about the explosions in Asia, you know, with mm -hmm. Africa and Pakistan. And the Kashmir issue mm -hmm. is still one that is a central issue that's going to have to be addressed. It's a central issue. It's going to be. It's one of the really hot spot areas of the world, I, I guess. Well, I think India could use it as a provocation to take back part of Pakistan. Uh -huh. um, and Pakistan is c clearly fanning the flames. I mean, they're not, it's, it's different. I haven't been in Kashmir since 91, and a lot has changed since then. I mean, they started out, I mean, they, they have genuine grievances against mm. India. Yeah. Right. And they have the genuine right, the same as East Timor does, yeah. because it's still considered disputed territory. But the Indians have been very clever at keeping it out of public debate. Okay, yeah, they have, yeah. And it, it's, it's brutal on the people. I mean, you, you know Farooq uh, Katwari? We, we Katwari, yeah, uh, he's an Ellen, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. It's been hard on people like that who, who've been trying to raise some awareness of the thing of, in of what's happening, and it, it's very hard to do because...